So what we're going to do is we're going to do a session where I'll give you my um, sort of evangelism 101 talk. And this is a funny talk to give uh, to this room because there's so many of y'all here who um, are, you know, are quite seasoned, quite seasoned with evangelists. <laughs> evangelists. Uh, so, uh, but I think it'll be helpful for a couple of reasons. One, it's good to revisit the basics. Uh, not everybody here is, is an evangelist. And uh, also, we'll have a video. And this could be of service to other people in the body of Christ. So we'll do, I'll do a training session. Then we're going to have uh, Ed speak uh, with respect to um, Hindus and Hare Krishnas and I don't even know what grammar to use for the whole space, but we need to be informed more about how to reach people down at the Color Festival happening this weekend. And then we'll have John Cower speak on uh, communicating the imputation of Christ in conversational evangelism. And then if we have time or if it seems conducive or wise, I can do a fourth, um, uh, another part two of evangelism training. But we're going to work in, in between those, some breaks, some bathroom breaks, some... Um, water breaks and time to talk with each other. So I'll get started here. This, this is uh, a talk I give to Sunday school settings or uh, training for teams, mission teams that come to Utah. And they're like, okay, we want to hit the streets. What do we do? So the, the goal of this talk is to take someone from um, I know nothing to I can share the gospel um, pretty quickly. So th these are meant to be encouraging tidbits that would help you use them on the street pretty quickly. None of this is meant to make you an expert. Uh, evangelism is less like seminary and more like Sunday school. Um, so when you think about evangelism, you might have a certain um, image in your mind. You might even put it into chat, G what, what is a uh, uh, mid journey or dolly or chat GPT and get a certain uh, picture or depiction of evangelism. But I want you to think broadly with me here about what evangelism might look like. Obviously, the content is the gospel. Uh, the subject of it is Jesus Christ. But the mode of communication or the, mo the sort of the well-rounded view of what the activity of evangelism looks like probably is broader than what you have in mind. And uh, the way I describe this is I have a, uh, six letters I put together uh, that just describe the, the different styles of, or modes of communication or activity, I call it LDSCEQ. Uh, I got to work in a Utah uh, acronym in there. LDSCEQ: listening, declaring, sharing, uh, correcting, encouraging, and questioning. So I'll walk through those six and why they're important. The first one is listening. If you're like me, you're a chrono chronic monologuer. Probably not everyone here is a chronic monologuer, but evangelists, we can be a quirky, eccentric, talkative bunch. Uh, <laughs> and I have to fight really hard to listen. I have to fight really hard to slow down and help another person participate and uh, create some silent space for them to think. So I have to work really hard at slowing down. The Bible speaks in Proverbs about the value of listening of not airing your own opinions with a kind of haste or arrogance. Uh, James says, be quick to, uh, to what? Listen. To listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry. Uh, when I get to listen to someone in conversation and be quiet and offer nonverbal acknowledgement, it gives another person space to, to talk. I also want to take some time to process someone else's story. I, as I ask them about their own religious background, I want to give them some breathing room, and I want to be able to hear myself think about what they're saying. I want to process what they say, and I want to really understand their worldview, their arguments, their thoughts, their feelings. Proverbs talks about how a man of understanding, um, he gets to know the heart of a man. He draws out the depths of, of the heart of a man. The second is declaring. <clears throat> the D there is for declaring. This is... This speaks of a bold assertion of a truth. Uh, evangelism cannot be reduced to asking questions or listening or sharing your opinion. It's, uh, it, it is, evangelism it can be like, we'll, we'll get to this in a second, you know, offering something up kindly and gently for consideration. But evangelism goes beyond that. Evangelism is a proclamation. 
It's an assertion. We're appealing to the authority of another. It's not ultimately our wit, our intelligence, our own authority. We are delivering a proclamation. We're heralding the news of a king who owns the universe. So there's a, an appropriate mode there at times, a punctuated mode perhaps of declaration, of heralding, of, pr of uh, proclaiming the truth. <clears throat> Peter says, let him who speaks speak the very word of God, the very words of God. This also encompasses a warning at times of bad news uh, of someone's terrible condition um, or a, an announcement of good news. I'm not suggesting this. I'm proclaiming this. Thirdly, we have sharing. Y and you see why I kind of put these alongside each other. Um, I'm not merely in declaration mode. There is a time uh, in, a, in evangelism to be in a kind of kind, may I show you something kind of mode, or can I offer this up for consideration? I don't want to reduce evangelism to a kind of probabilistic presentation of what might be true, but I do want people to kind of warm up to considering things at least, right? So I don't, I, I, um, I want to end at uh, truth, right? But it terminates on truth. But sometimes the gentle conversational pathway to that can be, may I, uh, may I offer up direct evidence for your consideration? May I, may I suggest this at least as a possibility, if that makes sense. I hope you hear me putting those two things together, declaring and sharing. And I, I want to grow in a, a compassionate boldness. I want to grow in being more thoughtful of someone's condition and the need of the moment. And I, but I also, I also want to remain bold. And I, I don't want to stop at the sort of interfaith ecumenical dialogue uh, level of things. I, I'm not merely here to have an interesting exchange of ideas. Um, I'm, not merely, I'm not here merely to learn about you. And I'm not here for you merely to learn about me. Uh, I'm, we're not, this isn't merely about you and me. I have a king who's coming back, who's risen from the dead. And there's a gospel I want you to hear about. But again, I want, I want that gentleness to come out. Uh, Paul says to show perfect courtesy to all men, to let your speech be seasoned with salt, uh, to, be, to be gracious. Uh, to, that phrase uh, haunts me. Show perfect courtesy to all men. Wow. Uh, oh, I have failed at that. Oh, how much grace I need for my failures, even in announcing the good news. So is that announcing? Is that what you're saying? Or after share? What was that? We have, uh, we have listening, uh, declaring, right. sharing, right. So more gentle. And then the next one we have is correcting. Correct. Correcting would be the fourth one. This is a repudiation of bad theology or false information or arrogant thoughts that are set up against God. This is... Uh, a calling to repentance. This is legitimately telling someone they're wrong, um, not for the sake of it by itself, but for the sake of truth, uh, for the sake of directness. Uh, th this is me not being passive aggressive. Uh, this is me being overt and direct. There's something very freeing, by the way, about stranger evangelism, because you're in a particular mode where it's especially appropriate to be overt and direct about these things. So obviously I don't want to be belligerent, but uh, correction is part and parcel of evangelism. Paul does this very quickly uh, when, he, when he's talking to all the pagans in Acts 14. And he, he says what God is not like and what he's not. I'm not a God. I have passions like normal human beings. Uh, and then he talks, starts correcting their view about God. Or in Acts 17, Paul immediately starts talking about what God is not like. He's not, uh, it's not appropriate to depict God with images built with human hands. Uh, He's not a God as though he needs anything. He's not served by human ha hands as though he needs anything. So part of evangelism is telling people what God is not like or what the truth isn't. Fifth, we have encouraging. This is commending what is noble and good. It is supporting moves in the right direction. And you'll find here talking to enough people that God is already at work. And many of the people you're speaking to they're already on a path where God is working in their lives. And it's very encouraging for a Christian to say, keep doing that. Yes, that's right. Uh, sometimes that's encouraging them to keep going down a path that's already in an opposite direction from the religion they were brought up in. Uh, for example, talking to Latter-day Saints who believe that God doesn't have a God uh, or that God has never been a sinner or that we can't become worthy of worship someday. 
there, there's many Latter-day Saints that at least have certain ideas that are uh, against sort of the, the traditional classical body of teachings of Mormonism. Uh, but we want to kind of fan the flame or encourage, yes, I talked to so many LDS teenagers and youth that prior to their mission have so many uh, basic, simple, good ideas about what God is that I know are going to be um, reversed in, in their mission experience. Um, and so it's important for me to kind of help, um, help them see that what they have right now is in part, they have some good ideas about who God is and they haven't really been matured to the, uh, to the extra special, you know, um, enlightened sort of view of Mormonism where people get in on deeper doctrine. Um, but I, there's certain people that they're just, God's already working in their life. The soil has already been tilled. They're already kind of uh, concerned about some of the things in their false religion. They already have a sense of the need for grace and the rightness of worshiping the Most High God. Um, they already have some positive ideas about Jesus. So I kind of want to take hold of what's good there, what God has already been doing. It doesn't necessarily mean they're saved. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be saved. But I want to help take those things and help point them in the right direction. Lastly, we have questioning. Questioning. This is just actively probing someone's heart and mind. Keith Walker likes to say that questions are like hooks. And they draw people in for evangelism. I want to ask questions to provoke thought. I want there to be introspection. I want to carry the conversation along. I want to learn how to take, uh, uh, imagine yourself holding a, an invisible microphone and you want to hand that off as much as you can. You just want to, if you're like me, you have to work at that, right? Just stop monologuing, pause, slow down, ask an open-ended question. To grow as an evangelist, to me, is in part to grow in asking quality questions that draw out the most important things. So if I put all those six things together, um, I think I have a well-rounded um, an evangelistic activity. If I'm learning to be around other mature believers who have been growing in their evangelism, I think I'm going to grow in those six areas. I like putting those together because it's not reduced to just ecumenical interfaith dialogue. It's not reduced to um, sort of belligerent declaration or just constant correction mode. Um, I'm not just encouraging people and not correcting them. I'm putting it all together. Now, I have a Bible verse that I would love to read to you that I think puts these things together really well. It's 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22 through 26. I'm going to read it out. It's a paragraph. And I want, you to, I want you to listen to this paragraph and see if you can pick up on some of those six things. Paul says, So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after having been captured by him to do his will. I love this passage because it puts so much together. It starts out by talking about the importance of calling upon the Lord alongside those who have a pure heart. Out of that pure heart, they love the Lord. So I'm in community with other believers. I'm in, I have friends in Christ that I'm, I'm in partnership with other believers. I'm in a local church, ideally. I am uh, growing. I'm getting close enough to have to forgive people. Uh, I'm, I'm in fellowship and community. I'm in with friendship. Um, I am um, seeking peace and righteousness and faith and love. So I have a baseline here for what a good Christian healthy community and is. And I, I want to call upon the Lord with these people. So I'm not a lone ranger. I'm not arrogant. I'm not, hopefully I'm not. You know I'm not pursuing this sort of uh, do my own thing. Um, I want to be in community with people. I don't want to be given over to foolish, ignorant controversies. I don't want to be a quarrelsome person. I don't want to be constantly wanting to debate about everything. Uh, now, 
don't hear me wrong, debate's not bad. I, I, correcting's not bad. You'll see here in a second. Um, cor uh, correcting can be very important. But there's a kind of quarrelsome spirit where you're just looking for, like, uh, I remember there was a youth team that... You better that, get that right. I, I, you better get that right. <laughs> You're wrong. No, you. No, you. I remember talking to a team that had done some evangelism at Temple Square, and there, was, there were some teenagers, really good uh, kids, but I remember one young man after a couple hours of evangelism uh, afterwards, I asked him, how did it go? And he said, oh, it was great. I really owned those Mormons. And I thought, oh, man, I, I really think that's tapping into his fleshly... Um, youthful, arrogant, uh, carnal sense. Like, you, you cannot be saved and enjoy it that way. You hear what I'm saying? Like, that's, a, that's not of the Spirit. Um, that's not walking by the Spirit. That's the kind of worldly pleasure. That's UFC, you know, uh, Fox News battle between two politicians going out. You're like, yeah, get them! You know, it, it, we're, we've been trained by the world to kind of have this carnal pleasure in people owning one another. Now, that said, there is a pleasure, there's a legitimate satisfaction in watching Jesus and the Gospels own the Pharisees, right? So, so there is something there about truth being uh, defended and watching... Overturning the money changers' tables is a little too far. Oh. <laughs> well, watching him in, like when he's, when, uh, in Holy Week when Jesus is being, um, I call it Stump the Messiah Day. I, I forget what day it was. It Tuesday where they throw everything they can at him, all the Pharisees, um, all the uh, Sadducees, um, was it the uh, Herodians? You, you, you try, no, you try, you try. And it's, it's satisfying to watch Jesus win debates and shut people down. Every time. So it's not inherently wrong, right? And I want to, I, I, there's satisfaction that you can legitimately have without, without uh, shame, without embarrassment. You can watch a good debate and watch the truth be defended and someone car uh, yeah, carry themselves well and watch error be corrected. But Remember here, the, the goal is representing Christ's kindness and affection for lost people. And we want, we want their hearts to be won over, right? We don't want them to be destroyed for the sake of destruction. We want them to be won over. We want their hearts to be convinced by the Holy Spirit. We want to sing with them. We want to be in church with them someday. We want to be friends in Christ with them we want to do devotions with them. We want to forgive each other in tight Christian communities. We want them to, to draw themselves, be drawn into Christian community and in unity with the gospel. And we want them to enjoy the most precious things in the whole world with us and to know the same God that we know and to worship him together. So there's a flavor to that. So yeah, I might take a pleasure in owning someone with truth, but there's a kind of brokenheartedness that, that should come with that where it's not a base carnal pleasure in owning someone. So there's a kind of youthful quarrelsomeness that even in our adult flesh, we have to put it to death. We want to avoid what breeds quarrels. Now Paul says, but be kind to everyone, able to teach. Now you might be thinking here, okay, well Paul says I should avoid being quarrel, quarrelsome, therefore I should avoid of correcting people. I should avoid teaching people, and that'll just help me avoid the, uh, the pushback. And that'll, that, that's a really safe place to be. I could just, we could just exchange mutual information, ideas, perspectives. I could just learn more about them. They can learn more about me. Tell that's wrong. it. That tell everybody that they're wrong. We'll, it's just, I'll just maximize peace and minimize tension. So Paul, Paul that's, where you're going, that's what you're going for, Paul, right? Well, Paul says, patiently enduring evil. And I'm like, well, wait. What am I doing that gives me blowback, pushback? What, what, what's raising the tension? What's, what's causing friction? Why would I have to endure evil? He says, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. So, okay, you're, you're telling me I have legitimate opponents, people who are opposing the gospel, who don't know the, the Lord, they don't have the truth. But you're telling me I need to teach them. I'm not merely sharing things with them. I'm teaching them. And as I correct them, I correct them. I'm, a, I'm to be gentle because my fleshly temptation is in the correction not to be gentle. Confession here. I have a, I have a tough time with the, some of the most dramatic interactions in my life with really emotionally invested situations where I need to rebuke a friend or a, or a child in my, my family. Um, I have to repent of being exasperated, right? 
my wife says, you do so well on the street. But man, when you, when you, when you rebuke your son about this or that, I, I can get really exasperated. That is my flesh. I've got to fight that. Um, Paul wants us to learn to correct with gentleness. And he wants us to teach, to actually teach, to be a teacher, teaching each other with all wisdom, Paul says in Colossians 3. As we do this, though, we're going to endure evil. We're going to get, we're going to get some sparks are going to fly. The flesh is going to be rubbed up against, so to speak. It's going to provoke the most demonic, uh, awful um, evil, the golem that's in the flesh. When you talk to sinners about their sin, when you talk to sinners about the, the lordship of Jesus, they can go from being completely serene to being uh, hostile in seconds. So I've got to be able to be faithful and to teach, and to correct, knowing that this is going to bring out sometimes the worst in people. And I've got to be able to um, be patient and kind as I do that. Now, you might think, wow, this is a weighty task. Who is sufficient for these things? Paul would say elsewhere. Who is sufficient to be about the work of evangelism or correction? Uh, sinners colliding with sinners, telling them about the most important things in the world, stirring up um, perhaps some pretty hard feelings about things. You, you, you want people to repent and know the Lord Jesus Christ. These are, this is the most dramatic, most important conversations in the entire world. And you're, you're attacking the things that people most hold deal, dear, idolatrously. Whew, how am I going to... Who, who is sufficient for these things? Paul then says, God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. So, pause... I can't socially engineer them into the kingdom. I can't out-nice them. Uh, although I should have courtesy and good manners and good, uh, good habits of, of interaction, those things won't save people. Th those things are not going to finally win the heart. Um, I, how good of an evangelist I am, or how terrible of an evangelist I am, won't finally determine whether this person knows the Lord. Paul just takes the whole burden can you feel that right now? He just takes the whole burden off the evangelist and he puts it somewhere else. Isn't that precious for us sinful evangelists who need to repent often? Wow, God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. So their lostness is a real lostness. We'll see that even more here in a second. They don't know the truth. They don't know it as they ought. They don't know it like Christians know it. They might intellectually grasp parts of it, but they can barely make a coherent sense out of it. Have you ever talked to a really educated person about grace? And it's like they could, they could wax on about history and science and physics, and uh, they, 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 would, they would outgun you intellectually. But as soon as you start talking about grace, it's like the lights aren't on. It's like they can't get it. It's a blindness. They don't know the truth. It's, it's like right there, but they can't see it, right? You're like, wow. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. And it's not merely a, um, an ignorance. It's a hardness of heart. Their heart is not softened. Their heart can't see things because of the... They have an ignorance that's owing to the hardness of their heart, Paul says elsewhere. So we need God to do a work that we can't. It says God may grant them repentance. It's a gift it's not something they can earn. I'm utterly dependent on God giving them repentance that leads to a knowledge of the truth. They're, they're in a stupor. They're doped, as it were, spiritually speaking. They're blind. Paul says they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil. So it's like their, their spiritual faculties aren't working properly. They're not, they're not using their minds properly. They can't think properly. It's like they're drunk almost. It's like Something's not clicking, and I can't make that happen. I can provide the firewood, but God alone can provide the fire. It, and it's wet. The, the wood's all wet. You know, God needs to rain down fire. God needs to give a new heart. But they're in a stupor, and they're under the snare of the devil. This isn't just them. Fundamentally, the problem is them, but it's worse. They're under a regime, a dominion. They're under the hierarchy or the domain of Satan himself. Satan and his demons 
are having a heyday with these people. They're under the prince of the power of the air. They're following the passions of their flesh. And they're a part of, if you wanted to, I, I don't know if there's any conspiracy theorists among us or those disposed to conspiracy theories, but if you wanted to sort of take the inclinations you have to believe that there is a conspiracy, elevate, escalate that all the way up to the demonic realm. That's, I think, where the real conspiracies are actually happening, where Satan and his demons are working within the world to bring about uh, evil. And people are like puppets. They're like pawns. So should that make us more angry with people? Or should it provoke a kind of compassion? My, my friend Rob Savolka says, uh, you wouldn't beat up a blind person, would you? So if you, if you realize people are in a stupor, uh, they're blind, well, maybe that should just pop, make us pause and say, I, maybe I should be kind here. Maybe I should be provoked to compassion. Maybe this isn't something that us having a really heated argument wouldn't fix. Um, maybe I should maintain dignity here as I teach and correct with patience and gentleness. Uh, Paul says they've been captured by him to do his will. So I, I love going to that passage. To me, it just brings all of it together and it keeps me from falling off the side of the horse over here where I'm to be a belligerent uh, um, jerk, um, where I, I, I just get wound up and there's a kind of wretched urgency and I just want to pound the issues and I stop being gentle and I stop trusting God's sovereignty and I, I start making excuses and I start rationalizing poor behavior and discourtesy or the other end of the horse where I start rationalizing um, passive aggressiveness or not being overt. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, we, we don't resort to cunning but by open statement of the truth, we would present ourselves uh, to the conscience of man. So Paul doesn't want to be um, sly or crafty. Uh, he wants you to be mature, but he wants you to be direct. Uh, so I want, I want people to know my agenda up front. I don't want to trick them. Um, I don't want to hold back what I really think. I don't want to, I don't want to, to deceive them into thinking, and I'm just interested to hear what they think. No, I have an agenda. I'm a born-again Christian. I, I want everyone to repent of false religion and come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. I want them to know the Bible. I think all other religions are fundamentally false, and uh, they're under the power of Satan. And all other um, uh, ultimate religious leaders from every different religion is a, is a tool of Satan. And uh, the Pope is an antichrist. I, I, I mean, I just cards on the table, right? You know, I'm, like I, I want to be kind and gentle and courteous, but I, I'm not here just to make friends, although I would love to make friends. I would love to be friendly with you, but I'm, I'm here because I have a message. I'm here because the Lord Jesus Christ is Lord and he therefore cancels all other religions, right? He alone is Lord. There's no other name by which we may be saved. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, so with that in mind, I, uh, one more setup for y'all. This is really helpful. Um, way back, like two decades ago, I was pretty wound up and consternated because there was this uh, dispute among Christians that I think kind of is perennial, kind of comes back over and over again. It's whether to be about the business of doing friendship evangelism or you might, people would say st street evangelism or something like that. So the, the terms I've gravitated toward to help think about the categories are relational evangelism and stranger evangelism. They're very helpful categories and I, I want to, to respect them and honor them both. Uh, and I want to, to talk positively about both of them, hold them up as complementary, and encourage Christians, even if, you're, if you've got both feet in one, to kind of dabble in the other, and, and encourage Christians that um, you might have a friend who's a really good stranger evangelist. He might have a lot of courage to offer you in, in your relational evangelism, and your gentleness and your patience in relational evangelism might s translate really well to the street and talking to strangers. So we have Christians that obviously gravitate toward either end, but I, I want to respect both in the body of Christ, but just acknowledge that they're different. Relational evangelism is with those I likely have future, uh, I likely have future contact with. These are people I'll see again and again and again, God willing, most likely. They're the kinds of people that I want to have relationship with and respect the nature of relationship that I'm in. Um, and then stranger evangelism, these are with people, these are encounters at all, with people I'll probably never see again. And I'm being very active and intentional. 
to share the gospel with them in a short-term fashion. And I'm trusting that God, I'm praying actually, often that God would supply friends in their life. I would love to be one of those friends. I would love to follow up. But I'm hoping that the body of Christ here is working together in relationship and in short-term interactions. I'm planting seeds. Hopefully they're watering those seeds. I want, those to, I want to respect those, those categories. You might think of uh, another dimension of evangelism. One is passive and, act, and the other is active. So sometimes evangelism drops in your lap. It happens to you and you're like, uh-oh, I better say something or I'm being disobedient to my conscience and to the Holy Spirit. I've got to say something. Uh, this opportunity just fell in my lap and if I don't say something, I'm going to hear about it at a final judgment. Someone's going to give me an elbow and like, why didn't you say something? Um, other evangelism is active. This is where we go out of our way to initiate, to create opportunities, to, to stir up in a good way, uh, opportunities for connections, touch points, conversations. So I, I don't want to just lean into the, you know, just spiritualize passive evangelism by saying, well, I'm just going to wait for God to give me the opportunities, right? Now, I want to be, I want to look for those opportunities that fall in my lap, but I also want to work at creating opportunities. So one of the things I would like to, I love, I would like to, I liked to tell the youth in Manti way back when we were all on the streets of Manti is when, when the pageant starts, when there's this event where all these people are out on the street, it's time to work. It's not time to be passive. It's time to go and do the hard work of evangelism. Evangelism is work. You put yourself out there. You get rejected a hundred times to, to maybe see one conversation. You get, you get rudely uh, rejected over and over and over again. You do the, uh, the social, uh, costly work of offering someone a tract and getting turned down and down, turned down, turned down. Or just asking someone, where are you from? And they, just, you know, they, they, they don't give you the time of day. Evangelism is the, the social work of getting out of your shell and breaking through the ice and swallowing the awkwardness of creating conversations with someone. Um, and... I want to embrace that. I want to look for passive opportunities and cr actively create opportunities. So uh, that's sort of the groundwork. That's, uh, that's helping us get prepared to talk about evangelism. I think out of respect for your um, attention spans, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to, because I'm already in the flow, I think this is what I'm going to do. We're going to take a 10 minute break. I'm going to come back. I'm going to actually do a part two of actual event, uh, actual um, tidbits you could take and use on the street today if necessary, right? Things that I use that if you were to hang around with me uh, for an hour, you would just hear these same things over and over and over again, and it would get you 80% of the way there. I want to help share some of my um, simple uh, tools, tool belt things. So if you'll come back in about, um, let's, let's do um, 10 after, uh, at 1.10, then I'll, I'm going to finish this out part two, and then we're going to hand it off to Ed and then John Coward.